I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom here on WHUS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you very much for tuning into my show this morning. We're going to be talking about defense spending on the show today. Does it really make us safe? Does it really require such a large, inordinate amount of funds being funneled into it constantly? Uh, the United States is one of the largest defense spending agencies in the entire world. Their defense spending is more than the entire world's military funding combined. And an important question to ask is always, does this spending actually bring us the goal that we have in mind when we're spending and allocating those resources towards a specific goal? So if we, if our goal is to build a garden and then we go out with uh, spoons and we're not using the correct tools to actually rototill the garden, it's going to take us years. Uh, we're not even going to be able to get the harvest in uh, by the time that food would normally be coming in. And so are the resources that we're allocating actually bringing about the goals that we desire. So that question applied here becomes, does this military spending, this massive reorganization and allocation of resources towards uh, building guns and bombs and uh, all the things that are used in warfare, does this bring us closer to our goal of making us safer and uh, making us better off in the world today? And since the government is constantly talking about terrorism, terror this, terror this, this organization, they're coming to kill you and all of this stuff, uh, it doesn't sound like all that money is being allocated towards really making us too much safer. Uh, we were also attacked on September 11th, and that was not um, known about. It was not uh, stopped. It was not um, – the military was of no help in that accord. Additionally, there is another problem that occurs when military is used throughout the world, and that's something that's not widely talked about. Um, that's the case of blowback, where people get very upset about the military being used, and they then become what the government now deems as terrorists. Uh, so when the Iraqis were invaded by the U.S. military, there was a lot of uh, destruction to the civilian infrastructure, uh, such as water treatment plants, um, electricity creation plants, and so so the standard of living of the people in that area uh, declined precipitously, and people were upset about that, and rightly so, I do believe. And so they got angry, and they get upset, and they take up arms against the invading army, and then they're deemed as terrorists. And, and you know, again, the, the civilians in the um, U.S. are burdened by the attacks that then come because of the blowback that was caused by the military going and doing all this stuff around the world. And so does all of this military spending make us more safe? That's the big question of the day. And again, economics is all about the allocation of scarce resources towards our goals and using the best use of those resources to meet those goals so that we're not squandering our time, our energy, the Earth's scarce resources, things like that. We don't want to be wasting our time and twiddling our thumbs when there are important things to be done around the world and in our own lives. So Ryan McMacken is going to talk a little bit more about this in his article, Does Military Defense Require Large States? Earlier this year, Lithuania reinstituted the military draft, which the Lithuanian state claimed was in response to threats from Russia. Ukraine has also recently reinstituted the draft with mixed political results and for similarly stated reasons. Regardless of how one gauges the magnitude of Russian aggression, the problem faced by small states like Lithuania is an important one. How can a small state with a small population and thus a small military ever hope to defend itself against a much larger state? This is an important question for libertarians, especially since, as Hans Hermann Hoppe has noted, if we must have states, a system of small independent states, i.e. Monaco, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, and arguably Switzerland, is much more ideal than a system of medium-sized or large states. 
We generally find that small states are less able to impose strong, coercive state monopolies, since small states face greater competition from surrounding states, and the more abusive states, if small, are at greater risk of losing their most productive citizens to emigration. Thus, small states have an incentive to pursue more laissez-faire policies. The natural implication of this is that libertarians and other proponents of laissez-faire would seek a world of small states through secession or through radical decentralization, which leads to de facto local autonomy. In response to this, opponents of secession and decentralization claim that only large and strong states can provide adequate military defense in the face of illiberal and foreign regimes. Quote, we can reduce the Americans and Europe's to a region of small, weak states, they may say, but that would leave them defenseless against domination by some future equivalent of China or Russia or the United States. But are small states really defenseless? Wealth, not size, buys defense. War making is an expensive and capital intensive endeavor. Ironically, some of the most warlike states often have their genesis in relatively laissez-faire economies, e.g. those of the American and Imperial British economies, because those economies are able to pro provide more tax revenue. The other side of the coin, however, is the fact that wealthier societies have a greater ability to defend themselves from aggressors. Wealthier societies can afford important and expensive armaments, such as anti-aircraft defenses and related defensive technologies. They can afford to pay for specialized, highly trained troops instead of resorting to a 100% conscription tax on people with no particular skill for soldiering. Wealthier societies can also more easily obtain nuclear weapons technology, which has clearly been shown to deter war-making by large aggressive states. Also, wealthier societies can buy defense from neighbors in a variety of other ways. They can employ foreign mercenaries, and they can simply bribe unfriendly foreign regimes. Potential foreign aggressors will also be reluctant to bomb wealthy foreign countries that are sources of lucrative trade and investment. And finally, in a wealthier society, residents at an individual and small organizational level are more capable, if the state permits it, of arming themselves, which has the effect of adding another layer of resistance to foreign aggression. The Advantages of Decentralization This latter advantage of economic wealth brings us to the tactical advantages of political and military decentralization. Hoppy writes, Quote, as a monopolist of ultimate decision-making, the state decides for everyone bindingly whether to resist or not, if to resist whether in the form of civil disobedience, armed resistance, or some combination thereof, and if armed resistance, of what form. If it decides to put up no resistance, this may be a well-meaning decision, or it may be the result of bribes or personal threats by the invading state. But in any case, it will certainly be contrary to the preferences of many people who would have liked to put up some resistance, and who are thus put in double jeopardy, because as resistors they disobey now their own state as well as the invader. On the other hand, if the state decides to resist, this again may be a well-meaning decision, or it may be the result of pride or fear, but in any case, it too will be contrary to the preferences of many citizens who would have liked to put up no resistance or to resist by different means and who are entangled now as accomplices in the state's schemes and subjected to the same collateral fallout and victor's justice as everyone else. The reaction of a free territory is distinctly different. There is no government which makes one decision. Instead, there are numerous institutions and individuals who choose their own defense strategy, either independent of or in cooperation with others, each in accordance with one's own risk assessment. Consequently, the aggressor has far more difficulties gathering information and conquering the territory. It is no longer sufficient to know the government to win one decisive battle or to gain control of government headquarters from where to transmit orders to the native population. 
Even if one opponent is known, one battle is won, or one defense agency defeated, this has no bearing on others. Moreover, the multitude of command structures and strategies, as well as the contractual character of a free society, affect the conduct of both armed and unarmed resistance. As for the former, in state territories the civilian population is typically unarmed and heavy reliance exists on regular tax and draft funded armies and conventional warfare. Hence, the defense forces create enemies even among its own citizenry, which the aggressor state can use to its own advantage, and in any case there is little to fear for the aggressor once the regular army is defeated. In contrast, the population of free territories is likely heavily armed, and the fighting done by irregular militias led by defense professionals and in the form of guerrilla or partisan warfare. All fighters are volunteers, and all of their support, food, shelter, logistical help, etc., is voluntary. Hence, guerrillas must be extremely friendly to their own population. But precisely this, their entire defensive character and near-unanimous support in public opinion can render them nearly invincible, even by numerically far superior invading armies. History provides numerous examples, Napoleon's defeat in Spain, France's defeat in Algeria, the U.S. defeat in Vietnam, Israel's defeat in South Lebanon. Collective Defense, Guerrilla Warfare, and Private Arms Rothbard explored these same themes in his work on the American Revolution, in which he noted the essential role of guerrilla warfare in that conflict. Simultaneously during the war, the United States functioned as a group of independent states that had come together for the purpose of collective defense. The coalition was successful against the most powerful state of the era, and the American states remained de facto independent small entities, even if they functioned internationally under a single diplomatic banner. Consequently, we find that effective military defense does not necessitate a centralized state or political unity. There is no compelling reason to believe that had there been 20 or 30 colonies instead of 13, that the outcome or conduct of the war on the side of the Americans would have been any different. These facts remain relevant even today, since other regions of the world could take advantage of the same dynamics, were they able to over overcome their commitments to nationalism and authoritarianism. For example, if Lithuania was serious about military defense, it might look to the fact that the former states of the Soviet bloc, from Estonia to Bulgaria, not including the former SSRs such as Ukraine, have a combined population of over 100 million people, and populations spread out over a large area. In other words, the region has the potential to mount a credible and effective military defense to foreign invaders through decentralized collective defense. Defensive military capability would also be greatly enhanced by a commitment to economic growth through deregulation and laissez-faire. Not surprisingly, though, most of the states of the region are unwilling to free their economies from government intervention. At the same time, those same states are committed to disarming the local population and centralizing military capability while palming off their defense costs on the American taxpayer via NATO. That is, they remain committed to the old models of state defense that have failed them spectacularly in the past. The region, like most of the world, remains mired in the idea that a centralized state and a defenseless private sector are the best option for defense. The number of privately owned farm, uh, firearms in Bulgaria, for example, is six guns per 100 people. In Poland, the number is 1.3 private guns per 100 people. There are even fewer private guns in Lithuania, 0 0.7 per 100, which has decided that enslaving young men via conscription is better than letting citizens have guns. When we compare these numbers to gun ownership in Switzerland, which has a rate of 45 guns per 100 people, the rate is 88 per 100 in the United States it becomes abundantly clear that the regimes of Eastern Europe are not serious about any type of military defense that does not prioritize protecting the state's monopoly of coercion over its own citizens. Ideology matters. 
economics, size, and the quality of war material all matter, but none of these factors can overcome the power of ideology. Hoppy writes, Quote, how is one to explain, for instance, that France has not long ago conquered Monaco, or Germany, Luxembourg, or Switzerland, Liechtenstein, or Italy, Vatican City, or the U.S., Costa Rica? Or how is one to explain that the U.S. does not finish the job in Iraq by simply killing all of the Iraqis? Surely, in terms of population, technology, and geography, such are manageable tasks. The reason for these omissions is not that French, German, Swiss, Italian, or U.S. state rulers have principled moral scruples against conquest, occupation, expropriation, confiscation, enslavement, and the imprisonment or killing of innocents. In fact, they do these things on a daily basis to their own population. What constrains the conduct of state rulers and explains their reluctance to do things that appear feasible from a technical point of view is public opinion domestically, but also abroad. As La Boete, Hume, Mises, Rothbard have all explained, government power ultimately rests on opinion, not brute force. Bush does not himself kill or put a gun to the head of those he orders to kill. Generals and soldiers follow his orders on their own. Nor can Bush force anyone to continue providing him with the funds needed for his aggression. The citizenry must do so on its own, because it believes that, by and large, it is the right thing to do. On the other hand, if the majority of generals, soldiers, and citizens stop believing in the legitimacy of Bush's commands, his commands turn into nothing more than hot air. Ultimately, no governmental structure can prevent war if the prevailing ideology is one that prefers violence to peace and nationalism to international laissez-faire. Likewise, Sweden and Norway, for example, no longer come to blows not because peace is imposed on them by NATO or the U.S., but because the people of the region view war as an untenable option. There is peace, for now, throughout most of the West because a few of the productive tax-paying citizens of the West are inclined to make war on other citizens of the West. This is an ideological triumph, not a military one. That article was by Ryan McMacken. Uh, it was called, Does Military Defense Require Large States? And you can read it online at the Mises.org webpage, M-I-S-E-S dot O-R-G. So that article talked a lot about the economic costs of war in its current and uh, conventional state and offered some alternatives as to how things might be organized in a society of a different type of economic model where people contributed to the defense agencies that they felt were most capable of providing the defense that they desired. So did you hear when uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe was talking about uh, different people in society and how when the state was invaded that they didn't have a choice in the outcome of what occurs. So some people, when an, a state is invading, would want to resist against that state, and some people would want to not resist against that state. And in the organization that we currently have, there is no way for people to have a say in the outcome of that situation. So if some people want to resist and some other people don't want to resist, the state gets to choose which of those options occurs. And uh, then the people who didn't want that outcome have no say. They, they can't possibly uh, put their preferences out on the table and have those needs met. Whereas with defense agencies and private companies who would provide this product, they would be able to choose a company that is most in line with their desired outcome. So, you know, some companies might choose to resist, some companies might choose to not resist, and we would have an outcome where the most amount of people would get to vote on whether or not that uh, situation occurred or something else occurred or, or anything along those lines. But how do we get from here to there is an essential question here. 
Um, I mean, I think that there's a humongous case for the decentralization of organizations to provide defense to people. I think that the market does a spectacular job anywhere that it's tried. And in this area, I think it would also excel. However, uh, getting people on board with that is, is a very difficult thing because there are so many people who benefit from the current system and the current structure as it stands. And so Ron Paul in this last article is going to ask the question, cui bono, who benefits from war and its current state? And uh, this was posted at the Ron Paul Institute. It's called The New Militarism, Who Profits? Militarism and military spending are everywhere on the rise, as the new Cold War propaganda seems to be paying off. The new threats that are being hyped bring big profits to military contractors and the network of think tanks they pay to produce pro-war propaganda. Here are just a few examples. The German government announced last week that it would purchase 100 more Leopard tanks, a 45% increase in the country's inventory. Germany had greatly reduced its inventory of tanks as the end of the Cold War meant the end of any threat of a Soviet ground invasion of Europe. The German government now claims that these 100 new tanks, which may cost nearly half a billion dollars, are necessary to respond to the new Russian assertiveness in that region. Never mind that Russia has neither invaded nor threatened any country in the region, much less a NATO member country. The U.S. Cold War-era nuclear bunker under Cheyenne Mountain, Colorado, which was all but shut down in the 25 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall, is being brought back to life. The Pentagon has committed nearly a billion dollars to upgrading the facility to its previous Cold War level of operations. U.S. defense contractor Raytheon will become the prime beneficiary of this contract. Raytheon is a major financial sponsor of think tanks like the Institute for the Study of War, which continuously churn out pro-war propaganda. I am sure these big contracts are a good return on that investment. NATO is also getting a massively expensive upgrade. The Alliance commissioned a new headquarters building in Brussels, Belgium, in 2010, which is supposed to be completed in 2016. The building looks like a hideous claw, and the final cost, if it is ever finished, will be well over $1 billion. That is more than twice what was originally budgeted. What a boondoggle. Is it any surprise that NATO bureaucrats and generals continuously try to terrify us with tales of the new Russian threat? They need to justify their expansion plans. So who is the real enemy? The Russians? No, the real enemy is the taxpayer. The real enemy is the middle class and the productive sectors of the economy. We are the victims of this new, runaway military spending. Every dollar or euro spent on a contrived threat is a dollar or euro taken out of the real economy and wasted on military Keynesianism. It is a dollar stolen from a small business owner that will not be invested in, in innovation, spent on research to combat disease, or even donated to charities that help the needy. One of the most pervasive and dangerous myths of our time is that military spending benefits an economy. This could not be further from the truth. Such spending benefits a thin layer of well-connected and well-paid elites. It diverts scarce resources from meeting the needs and desires of a population and channels them into manufacturing tools of destruction. The costs may be hidden by the money printing of the central banks, but they are eventually realized in the steady destruction of a currency. The elites are terrified that peace may finally break out, which will be bad for their profits. That is why they are trying to scuttle the Iran deal, nix the Cuba thaw, and drum up a new Red Scare coming from Moscow. We must not be fooled into believing their lies. That article was by Ron Paul. It was posted at the Ron Paul Institute, and it is called The New Militarism, Who Profits? 
And uh, this is really what we're up against. Those of us who are pro-peace and against war, we are up against the massive conglomerate of organizations that profit and benefit immensely from war and who go to the government to help to expand and create more of that war because they want to expand and create more of their product. Right? So um, think about a, a baker, a person who creates pies and cakes and all sorts of delicious confectionery treats. And uh, you think of him, and he wants to expand his business. He wants more people to come in and buy the pies. He wants more people to uh, create more of the pies so that he can sell more and so that he can profit more. And so he wants to expand his business as much as possible. Now, in the business of bakeries, uh, there is only a certain amount of demand. People get sick of the sweets and they want some other stuff. And so there's a balance that occurs that doesn't allow him to expand more than what the customers are actually willing to pay. Now, in the case of governments and taxation and wars, however, there is a seemingly unlimited, so long as they can sell that war to the public, uh, demand for the products that the uh, military manufacturers are creating. So they could just make more tanks and more bombs and more planes and all of this stuff ad infinitum uh, and constantly be able to sell that to the public so long as people go along with the scares that they could drum up. But of course, what Hans Hermann Hoppe pointed out in the first article is very important here. The ideology of people matters. If people just go along with whatever the state says in terms of uh, scaring them into giving over their money and sending their firstborns to the military and all of this stuff, if the people have the idea that this is what is good for society and beneficial to society, then this is what's going to happen. However, if people say no, if people have resistance to all of this stuff, then people's ideas are going to play out in the real world. So you are important, uh, I'm important, everybody is important, and our ideas do matter, and they do carry weight in the world today. So I hope that you enjoyed this. This has been a presentation of the Austrian Circle here on WHS Stores, 91.7 FM. We'll be here next week for another episode of the Austrian Circle. Have a great week. Take care. <laughs>